Okay, welcome. This is showcase number three, room A, AI from theory to practice with Dr. Paul Miller from Montgomery College. Um, I will be your moderator today. Um, we ask that uh, you remain on mute during the session, um, but feel free to put comments and questions in the chat. We will have five minutes at the end of the session for a live Q&A. Um, and Paul, I'll give you a five minute warning when you have about five minutes of presentation time left to ensure that we have that time for questions at the end. Um, you are being recorded and I'm gonna turn things over to Paul now. Thank you. Excellent, Annika, thank you so much. And uh, it's great to see everybody today. Um, I'm thrilled to be here to talk about the way in which Montgomery College is taking AI from th uh, theory to practice at our institution. And I know it's a very short presentation, so I'll go quickly so that we can get to those questions at the end of the presentation. So what I really wanted to highlight today in this journey from uh, theory to practice is something that we have at MC called the Academy for Teaching Transformation. So the Academy for Teaching Transformation is a highly um, re recognized opportunity across the college um, for faculty in their first three years and beyond to really participate in intense professional development um, in, the, uh, in order to really support their teaching and learning processes. So one of the things that we've added to the Academy for Teach and Transformation is the notion of AI. So the way that the Academy works, it's six hours, um, two, uh, sorry, two, three, two hour sessions um, across an extended period of time that gives us an opportunity to activate knowledge, to explore concepts and actually apply and reflect on those concepts within practice itself. So in this case, we do this through the lens of um, AI. So in order to activate uh, the, the information that the instructors need or the faculty need, we, in this case, we looked at the various models of AI and the history of AI landing us to where we're at today with generative AI models. So we started off with the statistical models, you know, the models that make predictions based upon data. We looked at uh, machine learning models where um, machines learn patterns and relationships from data deep learning models, um, the hierarchy of representation of data, and the reinforcing learning models, which actually connects very closely to us from optimal uh, conditioning um, from a behaviorist perspective, down to generative AI models. And you know, just like we know, the chat GPT hit us, um, you know, like a, like a speed bump, if you will, about 14, 15 months ago. And we've been really in this space since trying to make sense of this space. So the first session we actually spent going over the various models of AI and how the models of AI have led us to generative AI today and the influence it's having on our students and uh, the students and the learning environment itself. So we explore this um, specific uh, element through the lens of respect. So at Montgomery College, we've created this acronym so that um, faculty are aware of their expectations around AI. So teaching students to use AI responsibly and ethically is really the notion behind this RESPECT acronym. And we have written some information about this. We've been published on this. And we go through each step of the uh, RESPECT acronym so that faculty, again, know their expectations and know how they can communicate this effectively with their students and that AI has an intent because the big purpose of the academy is let's learn about the intent of what we need to do in order to get students to learn effectively within our classrooms. So we look at things like research skills, the ethical use, safety online, privacy, effective communication, critical thinking, and technology basics that are required to understand generative AI and the power of generative AI and how, how it can be used to support that teaching and learning process. We also created a taxonomy of AI use in education. So we kind of looked at Bloom's taxonomy and we said, okay, what would this look, sound, and feel like through the lens of actually um, AI and applying AI? So we actually uh, together developed with the faculty this taxonomy that takes us through each level of Bloom's, again, through the lens of AI application and integration within the course. And I'm sure this will be made available afterwards. So I'm not gonna go through each one of these steps. But just to highlight a view, you can see that the objectives in the integration really does support that specific level of Bloom's taxonomy. And the purpose for this is we want to make sure that faculty, again, are integrating AI the right way and the purposeful way, because it is just that tool. So this goes along with the conversations around TPAC, the Technological, Pedagogical, and Content Knowledge Framework, and how we can potentially use this as a tool to support that 
um, content and pedagogy in the courses itself. We also look at a student approach. We know that if students know the right information about AI, they will use it in a more effective way. So we have a five-step model that we follow in order to support this notion of a student-centered approach to AI integration and use. So the first thing in this model is that students truly understand the significance of generative AI for society, careers, and studies. You know, how does this not just help them in education, but how is this impact in their lives and how will they take this information and actually apply it and use it in the future? The second step of this model is students understand legitimate use of generative AI in their studies. So actually talking to them, um, creating rules, expectations around generative AI so that there are clear known expectations that students can be held um, accountable for in their use of generative AI. You know, one of the things that we found is faculty, uh, you know, were finding that students were using generative AI. And they said, you know, we don't want them to use this. And they always go back to that original question. Well, how are you talking to them? How are you engaging with them? And how are you letting your expectations known to them about your um, philosophies around AI and its use within your course? Um, the third piece is students are equipped to engage critically and ethically with generative AI. Again, what are the ethical uses of generative AI? How do you cite AI, for example, if, uh, if you are using it in a research paper? And we all know that MLA and APA have created the guidelines specifically for um, citing generative AI um, in uh, official acad academic um, uh, papers and, and uh, or the academia per se. The fourth piece of this is students explore generative AI strengths and limitations as aids to learning. You know, it's great that this thing is there and it's great that students have access to this, but what are the limitations of that? Again, teaching students that hallucinations are real, that misinformation is a part of the AI generative um, process. So if we know that those outcomes are there, Students have to understand and be told and to be taught about these strengths and limitations, again, for that ethical use. And then the last piece of the framework is students are assessed on what they need to know in an AI world. Again, bringing this into the course to say, how does this actually make sense in this specific situation? Um, and how might that differ in a different situation? So we really take this two-prong approach, effective engagement, ethical engagement, which ultimately creates the uh, complete package for student use of AI in the classroom. So again, it's getting faculty to understand that we have to teach these processes. We have to have conversations with our students because if we don't have those conversations, then we ultimately are not preparing our students for its ethical use and its use beyond the classroom itself. So how is it being used? Here are some uh, testimonials from um, some faculty members in uh, that participated in the Academy series. We're actually in a second iteration of the AI course right now. And you can see that there are different ways in which this is being used. So this is actually the student lens. So if you look at some of the quotes on the screen, sorry, this is the faculty lens, my apologies. The next, next slide is student lens. If you look at this, you can see that it's actually saving time from a faculty perspective. Right, it's saving time. It's giving resources. It's being a teacher's aid in some some respects, and it's really becoming this tool that can be used as a viable resource to help support the faculty in teaching students the objectives of the course. Right. So I'm not going to read through these, but you can uh, take a moment just to choose one or two of these to read as I'm talking. But again, faculty are really finding ways, creative ways to use this beyond the just going in there and asking for information. They're actually taking the information, they're refining the information, and they're integrating the information in a way that's actually making a difference. The one that really resonates with me is the middle one on the right-hand side, which is ChatGPT offered me a new way to articulate the concept of intentionality in a manner that res uh, resonated better with my students. You know, when we think about education, we know our craft very well, we know our subject matter very well, but we're not always the best at um, differentiating differentiate the way in which we explain it to our students. And ChatGPT gives us another mechanism to break down concepts that we may not know how to do so in a way that actually connects to our students themselves. So you can see this is being, um, for, this, for the faculty that went through this program, this is being adapted by them, it's being adopted by them, and it's making a difference. 
And here are some student testimonials from the students in the courses of the faculty that participated in the academy around the AI concepts. And you can see here that, again, this mirrors a lot of what the faculty is saying. It's helping students prepare um, for presentations. It's, it's giving them feedback. It's that 24-7 mechanism that's actually allowing them to have an aid to support their learning process, whether it be through language acquisition or uh, finding ways to, um, to understand concept development. It really is supporting students. And again, just to go back to what the faculty said, students said something very similar. Students are saying something very similar. The quote across the bottom actually speaks to that. Whenever I struggle with difficult topics in my course, I turn to ChatGPT for simplified explanations. So again, this is a way where students can actually use this. And I can speak to this actually from my 10th grade daughter who passed Algebra 2 by uh, coming home and unpacking the things that she was learning in class through ChatGPT in order to understand the information better. We're also using it from a professional development perspective. So we are in the middle right now of actually um, the upgrade between Blackboard Original to Blackboard Ultra. So we are developing demo courses for faculty to engage with so that they can see and learn about the new aspects of the new Ultra environment. So this week alone, within eight hours, I was able to de design and develop all of the content for a eight week course um, that included syllabuses, announcements, um, all of the content, you know, um, readings. So it really allowed me to develop this holistic course in a very simple way, um, in a very time effective way. Outside of ChatGPT, this probably would have taken me two weeks to develop. So from a development perspective, it's allowing us to get content that we need in a fast way in order to truly focus then on what the uh, concepts or the professional development outcomes truly are. Because in this case, it's not really about the course content, it's about the way that the course is presented and the way that we can structure courses within the new environment as faculty learn that new um, environment for themselves. And the last thing I wanted to highlight was out of the academy came the need for faculty guidelines around the use of AI. So we knew, and as we were working with faculty, we heard that faculty you know, wanted some official guidelines that they could use and that they could attach to their courses as to how to use this or how not to use this. So what we developed in um, partnership with the uh, faculty council through our governance process at uh, MC were faculty guidelines for the use of artificial intelligence that were influenced by the experiences of the faculty that went through the academy series. Um, so this is the, the output from the first time. I said we're in the second time offering it now. We're actually offering now a micro-credential in technology integration so that faculty, faculty can show how they're integrating um, tools like generative AI into the teaching and learning process aligned again with that TPAC understanding that technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge need to work together in order to create the optimal experience for students themselves. So again, this three-part process really has allowed us to not only uh, begin to help our faculty understand generative AI, but how to apply generative AI and the outcomes of that are really making a difference across our college through things like the guidelines and the micro-credentials that are recognizing faculty for their efforts of actually integrating this in a way that makes a difference for students. So that is the presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. A um, couple questions in here. The first is, um, how was AI used to develop readings? Um, you mentioned that on the professional development slide, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what uh, we've done is we've actually uh, created uh, sentence stems. And uh, so again, this was a demo course. So it was around the four seasons. It was a very basic topic. And uh, we created case studies, for example. So uh, how does uh, you know uh, hibernation affect, um, you know, why is hibernation um, something that happens in the winter months? Um, and it gave you a case study of uh, how bears and otters hibernate during the winter months. So it created all of these resources and tools that gave us the uh, information that we needed in order to populate the course in a very quick way. Um, it also gave us some uh, some ideas of some research journals that we could go and find official research journals in. 
um, so that we could, again, quickly grab those and put those into the course. Again, the course is being developed not so much from a content perspective, but from a holistic environment perspective so that people could actually go look at it from what it looks, sounds, and feels like. But again, having to do that without something like generative AI, having to write a syllabus, having to write all of the content would have taken us exponentially longer. Um, Heather is wondering what happens to the voice in something like this? Does it get sort of flattened, overly professional, impersonal? So that's a great question. So it really depends. So what I've actually found with generative AI is I always give it a model. So I pull down my course syllabus, for example, that I've written, and I say, I want you to de design a course syllabus using this model, um, but with this topic. And what it does is it begins to mirror the same language. So I never actually, when we talk about prompt engineering, I never go with just the output without providing a voice for it to emulate first. So I pull down information from my courses, my announcements, all of those kind of things, so that it has that model and that voice to emulate. So hopefully yeah, that, that answered the question. Right. And Carla is asking if it's possible to share the faculty course. Um, I have it in a Word document, and I'm happy to share it. So, Carla, if you send me an email, I can send it over to you. Um, the way I design courses I, is I actually design everything as a Word document first, so that then I, it's just plug and play into the LMS system. But I am more than happy to uh, send that over to you, Carla. So uh, if you shoot me an email, it's just paul.miller at montgomerycollege.edu. I'll be happy to send you the document that shows kind of the holistic thing that was developed. It's about 50 pages in length. Amazing. Great. Other questions for Paul? We have about four minutes remaining. You're welcome to come off mute and ask your question live if you'd like. Why there are why people are formulating the question, I would like to go back to Danielle's point about voice, because that is really important with generative AI. But with the new upgrades to the system, um, there was actually one that was just pushed out a couple of days ago with ChatGPT that is actually collecting information across threads. So it's learning about you now, not from an individual thread perspective, but a holistic thread perspective. So I think what we're gonna see, Danielle, is over time, your interactions with the generative AI systems are actually gonna learn more about your voice that is actually kind of, it's really exciting, but kind of scary all at the same time, because it is learning who you are and it's making adaptations around what you do and how you how you do it and how you say it. So I'm really excited about uh, that new function um, because again, it's it's remembering now your voice, um, but I always bring in my voice as, as something to replicate. Yeah, Heather, I, it's, it's an interesting function. Other questions for Paul? I, I have a question. I'm I'm curious. I always think when you when you do something again, you know, you have this great opportunity to improve what you're doing. Um, what kinds of changes have you been making as you offer these these sort of courses again? I, I know you started adding the micro credential. That's yeah. one great little incentive there. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think just in general, this world is moving so quickly that we have to almost redesign it every time we offer it. And I think that's the biggest piece. Um you know, it, it's hard to look back and say what well, I would change because we're changing it anyway, um, just because of the nature of the evolution of generative AI. You know, I think the other thing with this this process is, you know, faculty don't, don't realize that they've been living with generative AI for a really long time. And that's why we go through those models. We, you know, we look back at like the Enigma machine um, from the Second World War, that machine learning process, you know, and, and we really go back to those questions of can machines think? We know that early machine learning can problem solve, but what is the behavior? And that's kind of where we're at now is we're looking at how machine behavior is actually being uh, affected and how the outcome is so much more human. So that process has really been very interesting. Let me see. Um, I know there's a few questions in the chat box. Yeah, oh, Matt was wondering if, if you found any interest from your administrative and finance departments. Uh, administrative, yes. Um, finance, no. Um, uh, I think uh, from an administrative perspective, everybody's just really interested. So, you know, looking at the way in which, um, you know, the college can use this and leverage this to um, support its efforts. I know communications has really looked at this. 
Um, you know, everybody at the top is kind of looking at this to say, how can we really leverage this and how can it support what we do? So, you know, the the word is definitely out there. We have offered actually over 75 professional development sessions on generative AI in some way, shape or form um, since January of 2023. So we have been doing this for a really long time. Um, you know, I would like to say that we're leaders in this space, but I know everybody's doing really great things in this space. But, you know, not a week goes by that we're not engaging with a new group. Just yesterday, last night, I actually did a uh, presentation with the health department, the um, the nursing department at the uh, at the college and a regional collaborative talking about how AI is making a difference in healthcare. And it's really interesting because even though my background's in education, as I was preparing for the presentation, what we're seeing is so many parallels, and it all comes down to that ethical use, the bias that's involved in it. Like it, it all kind of funnels into us trying to make sense of this in our own discipline and making sense in a way that actually makes a difference without losing sight of things like voice and the human side of, of what we do. So it's really interesting. But yeah, administrative, yes. Financial, not so much. Okay. Um, well, we have come to time and the end of our session. So thank you, Paul, for sharing with us this great work. Uh, appreciate it. Um, I'm going to stop the recording.